I'd like to welcome you to uh, Chicago and uh, McCormick Lounge here on the banks of the Michigan, or Lake Michigan. I'm Mike Murphy. I direct the Hank Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage here at Loyola. And we're really happy you're with us. I'm so glad to see so many students in the, in the audience. I think you'll be in for a great treat as uh, Dr. Borg is a, um, is a favorite teacher at uh, Boston College. Um, so uh, welcome officially to the uh, keynote session of the Times and Spaces of 1968 featuring Dr. Julian Borg. Um, I just have a couple of remarks because uh, it's my honor to hand things over to Father Regan in a, in a moment who will offer some general re uh, remarks uh, before we begin, before he introduces uh, Dr. Kaufman and then Julian. Um, I think it's all about thank yous. Um, one note though, there is a misprint in the program. This session goes 7.30 to 9. My guess is we'll probably finish around 8.45 or so, 8.50, but we'll see how it goes. So please um, just be aware of that. Uh, I, I just um, am so grateful uh, to the many hands that have made um, this uh, symposium, this three-day symposium, rather light and energizing work. Uh, it's a great privilege and honor, and it really just uh, makes me very happy to uh, be able to do this work at Loyola with such great people, faculty, staff, uh, all of our workers at Loyola, the community who works here to keep this thing going, and of course our students. So thanks to you all. Uh, I want to thank the Hank Center staff uh, in particular, and that's uh, Megan and Kathleen, uh, Emily, Kate, Joe, Justina, and Mark for all their wonderful work. They, they're experts and they're all in, and I really appreciate that. We always want to thank the Hank family, Joan and Bill, for their generous contribution that makes these things go. Uh, they care enough about these, uh, this very valuable tradition this unique tradition, expansive tradition of the Catholic intellectual heritage. And uh, it's uh, extremely important uh, in so many ways, and we thank them for their support. Uh, we also want to thank our co-sponsors of this conference. We have roughly nine units who uh, have generously supported this in time, treasure, and talent. So I thank them publicly here, Department of History, Modern Languages and Literatures, uh, Theology and Religious Studies, Political Science, the College of Arts and Sciences, Film and Digital Media, the Ramanath Seminar, and the University Libraries. A special thanks goes tonight uh, to our, our session keynote co-sponsor, which is the Department of History and uh, uh, Father uh, Dr. Steve Schlesser, uh, who uh, is co-sponsoring this event in particular. So we're really happy, and thank you, Steve. Um, special thanks to my Partners in crime, I'll say, that we've had a great time working together. It's Dr. Ellie Shermer and Dr. Michelle Nickerson. We've kind of dreamt these things up since last spring, uh, and there's lots of these 1968 events, including Berrigan Week. Uh, last spring, we had something on uh, Humana Vitae. We've had a really successful film festival, and then we've had our three-day symposium here that's going, I think, very well with such great quality presentations. I want to thank all those panelists who are here today, too, as well, for your contribution and for traveling to Loyola. Uh, we were all edified by your work and by your uh, engagement. Um, so all those people, and then even uh, there, we've had interns in history helping us and so on. The, the list is long. So thank you very much. Um, it's my treat, too, to introduce another co-sponsor, uh, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and the Graduate School, and that's Father Tom Regan, who is going to welcome, on behalf of university leadership, um, Dr. Borg and you all to this session. And I'm really glad Tom agreed. He has, he has a general, uh, some memories of 1968. And I'm really, really pleased. <laughs> you might say something like, I was there. But, uh, but, uh, but um, I'm really glad that you uh, are doing this, uh, Father Regan. And I'd like to invite you up to the podium. Yeah, so let's hear it for Father Tom. I jumped at the chance to uh, do this. This is the first time I've ever been to a history event in which I can recall everything that happened in that year. Right? So this is not about World War II, right? This is it. And so when you think about it, there are some vague similarities between what's going on now and what's going on 50 years ago. And so I'd like to, I get invited as the dean to come to all these talks and welcome people, so welcome. But what would be really much more interesting, especially anticipating that we're going to have some students here, is just to give you a timeline of what happened in 1968. And so the philosopher of Soren Kierkegaard writes, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived going forwards, right? 
And so when you think about that, I look back, and the Smithsonian has these wonderful timelines, but I, I called up this timeline and said, oh my god, I remember everything. I can remember exactly where I was, what I was doing, right? And you realize that for me even, 1968 was a pivotal year, for some reasons I'll explain very briefly. But let me just walk you through a fire, a, a, a fire, unbelievable firestorm here. And as Dr. Murphy said yesterday, if social media had been present in 1968, we may not have made it out of the year alive. I mean, that's how much things happen. Pivotal events happening so back to back to back to back to back. It's amazing. So let's start the year off January 15th. At age 87, Jeanette Rankin, who was a congresswoman from Montana and a pacifist who had voted against U.S. participation in both World War I and World War II, leads some 5,000 women on a march in Washington to protest the Vietnam War. On January 23rd, North Korea seizes the USS Pueblo, claiming the surveillance ship had strayed into its waters. One crewman is killed, 82 others are imprisoned. I vividly remember, without any reference, seeing Captain Lloyd Booker there, all right? And that's the way the years, and what's, what's going on? The United States Navy, which seemed invincible in World War II, is now shattered. Well, a week later, North Vietnamese communists launched the Tet Offensive. The assault contradicts the Johnson administrator's narratives, that the communist forces are weak and the U.S. is winning the war. It's hard to argue with the pictures. You see them all around. On February 27th, in a CBS TV special, and you have to remember there's CBS, NBC, ABC, and public television. That's it. That's the media, right? But in a CBS television special, Walter Cronkite, the most trusted man in America, reports on his recent tour of Vietnam and says on camera, the U.S. war effort is mired in a stalemate and amplifies public skepticism about the war. Earth shattering, right? You can't, you can't believe what the administration is telling you. And then he comes out and names that. So on March 12th, Nixon wins 78% of the vote in New Hampshire, in the GOP. But what's more interesting coming out of New Hampshire is that e Eugene McCarthy, Minnesota's anti-war senator, takes a shocking 42% of the Democratic primary vote. Four days later, all right, emboldened by this result, New York Senator Robert F. Kennedy, he's a New York Senator, but he's from Massachusetts, all right, he enters the race for the Democratic presidential nomination, saying McCarthy's showing in New Hampshire has, quote, in his Boston accent, has proven how deep are the present divisions within our party and country. It is now unmistakably clear that we can change these disastrous, divisive policies only by changing the men who make them, unquote. Two weeks later, as war, this is two weeks later, right? As war pressures mount, President Lyndon Johnson, who in 1964 won 61% of the popular vote to Barry Goldwater's 39%, announces on television that he is not running for re-election. In his Texas drawl, he says, accordingly, I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. This is shocking. Four days later, Martin Luther King, in Memphis for the sanitation workers strike, is fatally shot on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. We remember that name, the Lorraine Motel. Gunman James Earl Ray, a white supremacist, flees the country. Over the next weeks, riots in more than 100 US cities leave 39 people dead, more than 2,600 injured, and 21,000 people are arrested, all right? April 13th, I turn 14, all right? <laughs> April 23rd. Students take over five buildings on Columbia University's campus and briefly hold the dean hostage, calling for the university to cut its ties to military research. Even as a 14-year-old, I realized that wasn't a good idea, taking the dean hostage. That's not a good idea. But a week later, they, they have these buildings for seven days. And on April 30th, the administration calls in the police, who respond with 1,000 New York police officers. More than 700 people are arrested, 132 students, Four faculty and 12 are injured. Amazing. You know, this is Columbia in, in 1968. On nine, it's just bizarre because on the 29th of April, the musical Hair opens on Broadway. And the words sex, drugs, and rock and roll and draft resistance now become staples of the American lexicon. All right? We'll hear about France, but on April 6th, 5,000 university students in Paris within a week start rioting. And therefore, within a week, throughout France, uh, workers are sta uh, staging sympathy strikes. The philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre takes to the streets along with the students 
further bringing activism into the academy. Right? On May 10th, the United States, you know, four days later, on May 10th, the United States begins peace talks in Paris. Little did I realize that a number of years later, I would be teaching in Ho Chi Minh City. Amazing. A week later from that, two Catholic priests, Father Philip Berrigan and, and, and his brother, Daniel, along with seven others soon to be known as the Catonville Nine, enter a selective service office in Catonsville, Maryland, and remove nearly 400 files and burn them in the parking lot with homemade napalm. Imagine, this is all, we're, we're only in May, you know? June 4th, Robert F. Kennedy, who is gaining momentum in his presidential campaign, wins the California primary. This is amazing. And that night, he's assassinated at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. I remember this like it was yesterday. This was a pivotal day in my life because earlier in the day, my eighth grade class went from Waltham, Massachusetts, a small town outside of Boston. We went down to see New York. It was my first time in New York. I had always seen, when I get on the Mass Turnpike, there was the next town out was Weston, Worcester, New York. I didn't want to go to Worcester. I wanted to go to New York since I was a little kid. And that day, we, I, I, had, I, I looked out the bus window, and I remember looking at the Empire State Building and saying, I wonder when I will see this next, because New York is going to be a very large focus of my life. And over the last 40 years, it has been. But that night, when we got out of the bus in the school parking lot, our parents met us with the words, Senator Kennedy has been shot. A vivid day, all right? To show you the resilience of the Kennedy family, on July 20th, as we just celebrated here in Chicago, the first Special Olympics under the direction of Bobby Kennedy's sister, Eunice, opened here at Soldiers Field with more than 1,000 athletes with intellectual disabilities competing in 200 events. Five days later, give us a break, five days later, you know, Pope Paul VI issues Humanae Vitae, reaffirming the Roman Catholic Church's opposition to artificial contraception and rejecting recommendations made under his predecessor, John XXIII. The fissures so evident throughout civil society were now becoming all too apparent within the church. On August 5th through 8th, the Republican National Convention formally nominates Richard Nixon. On August 20th, the Soviet Union, as we see in this picture over here, rolls in and brutally suppresses the Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia. On August 28th, the Democratic National Convention meets here in Chicago, and the police and the National Guard are called in to, and start clubbing and tear gassing hundreds of anti-war demonstrators, news reporters, and broadcasters. And, and therefore, the violence is broadcasted on national television. The next day, Humphrey is nominated, perceived as the heir to the Johnson legacy. I can vividly recall August 28th. I worked the afternoon shift at the Waltham Public Library, where I worked as a page shelving books for 95 cents an hour. It, the news was so interesting that I smuggled in a portable transistor radio, a portable radio. Imagine that. You could bring your music with you. Hard to believe, right? And a little earpiece because I didn't want to miss anything coming out of Chicago. And ultimately, I remember as I heard on the news, you know, Mayor Daley was screaming and jumping up and down. I said, who is this Mayor Daley? Hard to believe that years later, I would be teaching his granddaughter at Fairfield, right? Small world. But on September 9th, Arthur Ashe wins the US Open, becoming the first black man to win a Grand Slam tennis tournament. I, I laugh because I see so many students here on campus wearing your Stan Smith shoes. You have no idea who Stan Smith is. But for, he was a tennis player too, but he didn't turn pro until the following year in 1969. I, I got them when they were brand new and I'm on my like, eighth pair of Stan Smiths. They're so comfortable. On September 30th, Boeing rolls out the first 747 jet. Most people can't imagine how something that big can get in the air. It's incredible, right? October 16th, as we have on your program and in the sign out here, at the Olympic Games in Mexico City, Americans Tommy Smith and John Carlos receive the gold and bronze medals, and yet they raise their fists during the national anthem. The next day, the International, International Olympic Committee strips them of their medals and sends them home. On October 31st, citing progress in Paris, uh, Paris peace talks, Johnson orders a halt to all naval air and bombardments of North Vietnam effective the next day. Nixon will start the bombing again. But on November 5th, Nixon wins the presidency, beating Humphrey by just 7 tenths of 0.7% uh, of the popular vote. Segregationist George Wallace carries five southern states, hard to believe. But the good news is on that same day, 
Shirley Chisholm of New York becomes the first black woman elected to the U.S. House Representatives. The week before, in my ninth grade class, I remember making a speech urging people, well, not that we could, to vote for Humphrey. Uh, I still thought that Democrats were making great progress on the war on poverty. And in those days, I was still buying it. I came from an army household, but I mean, my, my, my father was in the army, and we, we were still talking about the domino theory, which we'll hear. And uh, if we didn't stand fa fast in Vietnam, the domino theory meant that all Asia would go threatening democracy worldwide. We'll find out that was wrong. But ultimately, on the 9th of November, Yale University, after seven, two, two, 267 years, decides to admit female undergraduates. Good for Yale beginning in the fall semester 1969. On November 26, O.J. Simpson from USC wins the Heisman Trophy. And then finally, as if to bookend this incredible roller coaster ride, on December 23rd, uh, North Korea releases the Pueblo crew that it had captured on the 23rd of January, but keeps the ship where it's still on display in North Korea this day. What an amazing roller coaster ride, all in one year. But historians keep us Apollo, oh, well, yeah, Apollo 8's in there, too. Uh, these are the things I experienced personally. I didn't get on Apollo 8. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the thing is that there's a lot I left out. But historians keep us honest. One of the first big studies of Vietnam was David Halberstrom's The Best and the Brightest. And the narrative there was that Kennedy had emptied out Cambridge and brought some of the brightest minds in the country to work in Washington. And somehow things didn't go right. That was the narrative. But time passes, and archives open, and we find out there's a very different story than Hal Wostrom painted. And so ultimately, H.R. McMaster's book, Dereliction of Duty, Johnson, McNamara, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Lies that Led to Vietnam, opens the archives and shows us a whole lot of things were going on. So in these brief overview remarks, I have just touched the surface of an amazing year. And our speakers throughout this wonderful conference have elaborated and will uh, discuss far more substantively and insightfully than I can on the weeds that has to be explored. But tonight I am delighted to welcome uh, and extend both an institutional and personal welcome to Professor Julian Borg from Boston College. Professor Borg, I owe a great deal uh, to the history department at BC for not only instilling in me a great love of history when I was an undergraduate, but also a profound respect for the importance of the history as a discipline. Through the craft through their craft, historians allow the voiceless to be heard and a greater understanding of events to be unveiled. It is not ironic that etymologically aletheia, the Greek word for truth, means uncovering. I am sure that we will be able to witness that firsthand in your remarks this evening. Welcome to Loyola. We look forward to hearing your presentation tonight. And now it's my privilege to introduce Suzanne Kaufman, who will introduce our speaker. So I'm, I'm going to use this, and hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, thank you, Dean Regan. So Dean Regan is a hard act to follow. Um, I can tell you that I was uh, three years old in 1968. So I have no memories of 68 to share. I'm told that I was sent to uh, nursery school, and I was also told that I was an extremely difficult child. Um, and so in that sense, I like to think I fit in with the tone of 68, even as a three-year-old. So, um, so let me begin by first I wanted to take a minute and um, thank um, Michael Murphy, because he got up and did all the thank yous for everybody else, but I don't think anyone has given him a proper thank you. So I want to say thank you for all your tireless work in you and your entire team and putting an extraordinary symposium together. It's been a really great fall semester and it's not done yet. There's going to be things going on even after this evening. So thank you so much for, for all your work. And let me turn to the, uh, to the evening at hand here. So it's my, it's my great pleasure um, and honor to introduce Professor Julian Borg. Julian Borg is an Associate Professor of History at Boston College. He received his BA from Brown University, and then he went on to get a master's degree from the Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley, and then his doctorate in history from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, Julian Borg is a historian of modern, modern French history, and he's done extensive research on Paris, May 68. He is the author of um, From Revolution to Ethics, 
May 1968 and Contemporary French Thought, which was published in 2007 and was recently reissued with a new preface in 2017. Um, this book was awarded the Morris D. Forkach, I'm not sure if I said that right, uh, the Forkach Book Prize from the Journal of the History of Ideas in 2008. Um, in this work, uh, Julian Borg challenged, in some sense, many past interpretations of May 68 that typically focused on political failures or sometimes the intellectual limits of these student revolts. Professor Borg, by contrast, showed that the chaotic, festival-like expressions of revolt and rejection uh, of the status quo, of the state, and of many more things in 68 was more than just a momentary student rebellion. He argues persuasively in this book that May 68 led to a new and profound emphasis in ethical thought that has shaped intellectual life and social movements into the 21st century. Movements as diverse as things like prison reform to the gay rights movement. So in this sense, uh, Julian Borg's book has shown in, in many ways the large and lasting impact of 68 for our world today. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Borg has also been the recipient of many grants and fellowships. He's published numerous articles, too numerous to list, so I'm just going to mention he's also the author of a 2004 edited volume, After the Deluge, New Perspectives on the Intellectual and Cultural History of Postwar France. He is currently writing a book on the conceptual history of terrorism since the 18th century. He's obviously got wide-ranging and uh, interesting interests. The title of Julian Borg's talk tonight is The Times and Spaces of 1968. So without further ado, I'm going to let Julian take the, st take the stage. Okay, well, in the spirit of um, thanks, let me continue to say thank you, uh, Father Regan and Mike Murphy and the Hank Center, uh, Suzanne uh, for that wonderful introduction, Father Schlesser, um, and especially, and it needs to be pointed out, um, Megan and Joseph, who uh, have been the real sort of uh, impresarios of this event of making it happen, so thank you all. Now, the task of a keynote, which is to convey fundamentals or a summary overview, is especially complicated and challenged by the theme of Global 1968. The topic seems to confront us with an explicit impossibility of easily sum summing things up. And it's worth reflecting on that very fact. It's difficult to sum up what happened, what was 68 about. And indeed, for some people, the very form of a keynote runs counter to a certain spirit of 68 in which the voices of the many ought not defer to the bird's eye view uh, of a presumptive expert. So at the outset, let me say I make no claim to any particular proficiency between, beyond that of my colleagues, uh, many of whom are deeply distinguished, who already spoke today and will speak tomorrow. Instead, I'd like to, to invoke another meaning of keynote, and that is notes by which a musical scale can be recognized. And what I'll try to do this evening is echo some of the melodies we've already heard yesterday and today and anticipate others that we will hear tomorrow because the true spirit of 1968 is that all of us are part of a chorus. This event has focused yesterday on the themes of citizenship, violence, peacemaking, and the church. Today we heard about Chicago and different forms of justice. It was striking in all six presentations today the way that the positive legacies of 1968, the often quiet continuities into later decades shone through. And what I'd like to do this evening is three things. I'd like to talk about different times and spaces of 1968. And remarkably, Judy Wu used that word simultaneity in her presentation. And also, uh, Malgor Zata uh, introduced the word multiplicity in her presentation. I'd like to follow up on those terms and also talk about what is an event and reflections on events that happened in 1968. So different times and spaces. So I'm going to unpack these three different words. Then, a little more briefly, I'll talk about politics in 1968 and what I like to talk about as the romantic and the functional, 
And finally, I will conclude with some reflections on our relationship to 1968 today. And in doing all this, I'd like to try to follow the advice that John Paul Sartre was given in February 1969. He went before a group of students and he found a note on uh, uh, the podium in front of him and the note said, Sartre, be clear, be brief. <laughs> I'm not sure I will do either, but I will uh, do my, try my best. So there are indeed many times in spaces of 1968 anniversaries. Remarkably, every 10 years, there are conferences and books and talks about 1968 in 78, 88, all the way to the 50th anniversary. There is the time of memory and the time of forgetting, the tensions between memory and history, the time of generations. I imagine there's three types of people in this room people that have memories of 1968, those like myself who have grown up under the shadow of the 60s my entire life, and also younger people who are here either because they're required for a class or because they want to know what all the fuss is about. What's this big deal about 1968? There are larger timelines in history that precede 1968 and continue 50 years later today, times of beginnings and endings, changes and continuities. There's also many spaces of 1968, the global 68, local experiences, the space in 1968 and the 60s of the private and personal, the transformations that happened to what it meant to be a self and a person, but also the spaces of the public, the spaces of culture and politics and society. So I'd like to focus on a few of these times and spaces. And in some sense, it involves unpacking what I'll call the logic of the obvious. And the first obvious statement to make is that 1968, as we've heard in great detail, and I'll simply be giving commentary on Father Regan's wonderful presentation and timeline, that 1968 was an eventful year. We need to say immediately that all years are eventful. And also that 1968, that phrase, does not have any necessary recon recognizable meaning in large parts of the world. Now that said, it is nevertheless striking that dramatic influential events were happening all around the world in 1968, both back to back one after the other, but also crucially I think at the same time, simultaneously. And I'm going to give you three quick examples really building on what was already said. The Tet Offensive exploded in 1968 as the Viet Cong in the South and the North Vietnamese armies that had uh, smuggled themselves into southern Vietnam, Vietnam put the American military on its back foot in a surprise series of attacks. That same month in February 1968, a very important anti-war student conference was held in Berlin. And students from the United States and Germany and France, Western Europe countries gathered in Berlin said, if these poor peasants, many of whom are crawling around uh, uh, fighting the American army, can put this powerful army on the defensive. We should be doing more to bring this immoral war to a close. Students, therefore, at this conference were inspired by the Tet Offensive and saw themselves allied to what was happening there. Also the month of February, happening at the same time, two African Americans are killed in Orangeburg, South Carolina. This doesn't often figure in the iconic stories of 1968, but this is happening at the same time. Second example, April 11th, Lyndon Johnson signs the Fair Housing Act in a first attempt to bring to an end the decades, if not centuries long, practices of housing discrimination and redlining practices that will continue uh, in later decades. That same day, however, Rudy Duchka, the student leader from that Berlin conference survives an assassination attempt in Germany. That same evening of April 11th, students who had occupied Columbia University marched to downtown Manhattan and the offices of the German publishing house Springer, and they protest outside this publishing house because that publishing house had been uh, uh, having articles that were stirring up anti-student dissent, and they were blaming the assassination attempt of Rudi Duchka on that publishing house. Third quick example, we began to hear today and we'll hear more tomorrow about the student massacre at Tlatelolco, Mexico City on the eve of the Olympics in Mexico. October 2nd, the massacre happens. We already heard, uh, saw the image and heard again invoked uh, uh, this evening of October 16th, Tommy Smith and John Carlos 
raising their hands while they were on the podium. Now, between October 2nd and October 16th, on October 5th, a civil rights movement is planned in Derry in Northern Ireland. The civil rights movement uh, march is banned by the British government and goes ahead, and there is great violence ensues. The marchers modeled their, uh, their program explicitly on the American civil rights movement. And one of the leaders, Eamon McCann, right before he gets up to give a speech on October 5th, someone yells from the crowd, don't forget the students in Mexico. Not only was the civil rights movement in Ireland based on the American civil rights movement, but the anti-civil rights movement, a leader like Ian Paisley in Northern Ireland, opposed to the civil rights for Catholic residents of Northern Ireland, comes to the United States and visits with white supremacists, says, you are opposed to civil rights in America, and I am opposed to civil rights in Northern Ireland. These are just brief pie slices, examples from a very dense and intense year. It was the accumulation, the thickness of all these events that had a quickening effect. There was in this year widespread perceptions that rapid and monumental changes were happening in front of people. History itself seemed to be speeding up there was also a new awareness of our common world space. And we need to pause and reflect how original that new awareness of our common world space was. The idea that what happens over there affects me. That there is no escape from our small blue planet. This is a truism in the age of Twitter and social media. But at this moment, it was a new enough experience that young people in particular all around the world felt part of an imagined global community. They identified with shared aspiration and commitments that pursued different projects, projects of emancipation. Another image from 1968, from December 24th, captures this new sense of global imagined community. The very first time our world was seen from this perspective is an image of 1968, moonrise. Now, paradoxically, this planetary perspective showed that there was a great sense of shared planetary experience beyond borders and languages and creeds. At the same time, there's a way that time itself is reduced to space, is flattened. This is the first sign of another quality of 1968 that I'm going to refer to this evening as the dehistoricization of experience. Time is reduced to space. Where is historical action? Where are the actors in this image? The paradox, therefore, of shared historical action around the globe and also the erasure the dehistoricization of experience, a point that I'll unpack as I move forward. So much for simultaneity. The second theme that I want to uh, discuss, the second obvious point whose logic I want to unpack, is the simple fact that there were many circumstances, forces, movements, and events during 1968, as Father Regan uh, recounted for us. In fact, that there were so many, it's virtually impossible to sum up what happened in 1968? There's a complexity to 1968 that makes our world space rather unmappable. So multiplicity is an essential quality of 1968. And this poses to us the challenge of representing 1968. That word represent, representation is a powerful word. If tomorrow you talk about what you hear tonight, to someone who wasn't here, you will give your version of it. Whatever is happening in this presence, you will represent it to someone else. And there will be a gap, a slip, between what is happening here and your version of it. This happens in knowledge all the time. In politics, we live in a representative democracy. And there's great debate in our country right now. Do our representatives in Washington represent the presence of who we are as a people? Or is there a gap? representation becomes problematized and even politicized in ways in 1968 in ways that have consequences until today. 
The multiplicity of 1968 suggests that every time we try to grasp 1968, it eludes our grasp. It tends to slip away. There is always somebody else's 1968, another perspective, another voice that needs to speak and be heard. And in fact, 1968 does not simply mean that calendar year. 1968 is part of a larger moment that is a symbol for that moment. The technical term from literary theory is it's a synecdoche, part of something which is a symbol for something that is larger. 1968 is a dense and intense year that is part of a whole era. Now, historians are in the process of dividing up that era differently. In the Northern Hemisphere, we might say that the 60s began with rebels without causes and rebels with causes, Rosa Parks and the Civil Rights Movement in 1955. And perhaps, pessimistically, the 60s ended in 1977 in Germany in the Northern Hemisphere when the Bader Meinhof left-wing terrorist group imploded on itself with several of its members committing suicide. But in the Global South, there's a different timeline. That image on the left, lower left, is from 1961, but those are leaders of what was known as the non-aligned movement. New developing and newly freed and new cre newly created countries that were saying, forget a new form of colonialism under the United States or the Soviet Union after we've gotten out from the influence of Europe. We want optimistically to go our own direction, to develop our own societies and our own national destinies. So the leaders there of Nehru, Nakuma, Nasser, Sukarno, and Tito. By 1974, this other narrative of the 60s reaches another perhaps pessimistic ending point with the collapse of a project at the United Nations called the New International Economic Order, an attempt to redress explicitly global economic inequities between the northern and southern hemispheres. So I give these as examples of that there are many ways to slice the 60s. There's many beginnings and endings. And these timelines don't always add up. There are multiple timelines. Sometimes they operate in parallel. Sometimes they intersect. Sometimes they part company. Multiplicity of the 60s. Multiplicity of 1968. Furthermore, some protagonists in the 1960s championed plurality and multiplicity as values. Here I'm thinking of new social movements involving people of color and women and sexual minorities. The language of multiplicity had tremendous implications for what I would call the democratic imagination, small d democracy. Language of people power or people's democracy or eventually in Czechoslovakia by 1978, the power of the powerless. The multiplicity of politics, that ordinary people matter in new ways. In this sense, 1968 and 1960s was an important chapter in a longer story of the increase and growth of the meanings of freedom and equality. An important chapter in a longer story of the history of democracy. So, so to summarize, and then we have other examples here behind the Iron Curtain in Czechoslovakia and then in Japan. To summarize this point about multiplicity, we have on one hand the many faces of 1968 in the 60s, which complicates representation. Who's 1968? What is the meaning of 1968? We're still talking about it 50 years later. World War II is kind of a, we settled that issue. It's a pretty simple story. There were good guys and bad guys. On the other hand, multiplicity means here the assertion of plurality as a value with democratic implications. Now, the third time I want to talk about, before I turn explicitly to the question of politics, is the temporality, the time of events. And to do that, I do want to return to the iconic student and worker revolts of France of May and June 1968. I think one of the challenges of talking about 1968 in 2018, which is different than 10 or 20 years ago, is how can we integrate stories of iconic sites of 1968, familiar sites, with constantly newly discovered and recovered 
uh, 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 marginal stories that have been previously neglected. How can we bring these two types of stories together? In early May in France, students there, as elsewhere in the world, were upset about the Vietnam War. They were dissatisfied with student living conditions. Male and female students in French dormitories were not allowed to visit one another's dorms. Students found their education alienating and disconnected from their own concerns. Student dissatisfaction about their own experience as well as opposition to the Vietnam War within a number of weeks turned into the largest general strike in 20th century Europe as upwards of 10 million workers went on strike and the government almost collapsed. The president of France, Charles de Gaulle, in late May leaves the country, not telling anyone, any of his ministers, to a military base in Germany to make sure he had the support of the army in case the crisis worsened and the government and the, and the, and the constitution would collapse. We say more about these events themselves, but I bring them up, I introduce them to point out that important French intellectuals at the moment started to ask the question, what is an event? How do we explain surprising, explosive happenings that seem to come out of nowhere and that extraordinarily, extraordinarily suspend day-to-day -day life? No one saw this coming in France. And so French thinkers in the moment were thinking about what is an event? We are experiencing les événements, the events. From then into today in France, that's what the French call this happening, the events. What is an event? I'm going to give you two examples of thinkers who reflected on this question. The first is the Marxist philosopher Henri Lefebvre, who says, events disprove forecasts. To the extent that events are historic, they upset calculations. Events upset the structures that made them possible. The second example is the Jesuit historian Michel de Certeau. The event cannot be dissociated from the options to which it gave place. It is that space constituted by often surprising choices. And he continues a somewhat longer quote, an event is not what can be seen and known about its happening, what, what it becomes and above all for us. And that us there I say involves us in this room and not just his audience in 1968. This option is grasped only in risk, not by observation. Interpretation could still be the sign of events. The event engages the structure. The whole order is at stake. And first of all, it seems to me a system, there's that word again, of representation. What grounds both knowledge and politics. Who is doing the speaking? Who am I speaking for? Who am I representing? What knowledge am I conveying? What political position am I conveying? Events disrupt structures. Events from this view are unpredictable, and events are uncontrollable. Events disrupt the normal functioning of day-to-day -day life. They erupt. In fact, Michel de Certeau, as a, as in a Catholic vein, can, joins the, uh, plays with the term event and advent. The transcendent, spontaneous explosion of possibility. There's a great optimism in this moment in France. From one day to the next, things seemed possible on a Wednesday that seemed impossible on a Tuesday. How can we come to terms with this extraordinary eruptive experience. It seems to me that what's at stake here is an extraordinary eruptive relationship to time. Events, these thinkers say, open a space in which multiplicity can circulate. When I've interviewed people who lived through France in the 1968 events, many of them comment about an experience that they cannot forget and the experience of a type of freedom and a type of being with others. There was a convergence of new forms of freedom 
that the chains of everyday life were thrown off in an extraordinary moment, but they didn't feel lonely because they experienced that freedom in solidarity with others. It's an exceptional moment. Ordinary life is not like that. It's important to talk about what events are because one of the major questions after 1968, particularly in the 1970s is, are we gonna go back to how things were before? This is a poster from 1968, Return to Normality. Or is this event the beginning of a longer process? The language here, the beginning of a long struggle. The Maoist phrase, the long march through the institutions was invoked today, and that's another way of framing this possibility or this um, ongoing project. In other words, after 1968, many young people in particular asked the question, can we keep the events alive? Can we keep that experience of freedom and solidarity that we didn't read about, we didn't make up, we experienced it, can we keep that alive? What would a politics of the event look like? In other words, after 1968, could new structures be found that would be equal to the experience of the events of 1968? How could we represent those events? Not just as a matter of interpretation, but as a matter of politics and institutions. And I guess one of the things I want to suggest tonight is the fact that we are still interpreting and investigating and questioning and discussing 1968 means that that process is not over. It is not foreclosed. It's continuing. So it's in this vein I want to turn more briefly now to my second theme of politics and talk about politics in a romantic vein and politics as what I'll call function. Or you can think of this as romance and tragedy. Politics in an ordinary sense was happening in 1968. The leaders of China, the Soviet Union, the United States, and France had very little in common except for one thing they shared. They were all freaking out about young people in their different countries. This is Jeremy, Sur Jeremy uh, Surrey's argument that was raised earlier today. Geopolitics continued. In Paris, in the, in the spring of 1968, representatives of the United States, the North Vietnamese, gathered around a table on the right bank of Paris to talk about peace and ending the Vietnam War. On the left bank, simultaneously, the students had occupied their university and set up barricades. Ordinary politics were happening, but what we focus on when we refer to the projects of 1968 is often extraordinary politics. Extraordinary politics, politics of the event. In the book I wrote 10 years ago, I referred to this as the ethics of liberation. Maybe now I would refer to it as imagining politics otherwise, differently politics of emancipation. And here I'm going to give you a complex recipe. Emancipation in this moment is no longer simply about governments and elections and green tables and ballrooms. Emancipation is about my relationship to myself, my desires, my aspirations, my need to express who I am. Emancipation is about my relationship to you, and our intersubjective relationships of how we treat each other. Emancipation in this moment is also about my relationship to institutions, such as hospitals and universities and prisons. Emancipation also involves politics in an ordinary sense, my relationship to governments and their representatives, including the police. Also at this time, emancipation goes global. It's about my relationship to humanity and human rights, and what we could call the bios, life in general, on this planet and beyond. There's a complexity here to what politics means, not just the personal is political, but interpersonal and institutional, and the environment as a whole takes on a political cast. 
This is a paradigm shift. This is not a question of whether the 60s succeeded or failed because the rules of the game around the world changed in this moment. Multiplicity around the world describes our experience. Now in this context, it seems to me, uh, these are examples of different new forms of politics, including the Chinese Cultural Revolution, which begins at the University of Peking in 1966 as a student movement. What's different here than all the other ones is that Mao and the Chinese state decide to canalize and direct and in many ways take over the student movement, which becomes the Cultural Revolution, which has both an emancipatory side and also an ugly violent side. It happens differently, cultural politics in China, than it does in the West. I want to emphasize a legacy we've inherited of a division between romantic politics and functional politics. At the time, this was sometimes referred to as the tension between revolution and reform. Political romanticism has a long and complex history. There's been right-wing and left-wing versions of political rom romanticism, but here I want to refer to the term romance in a very literal sense, referring to desire and idealization. The possibility is what romance is about. There's a slogan from the 1990s that captures this spirit of romantic politics. It's from the 90s, but it traces its origins to the 1960s, and that's a slogan that says, another world is possible. Another world is possible. This is a utopian moment, that peace, justice, and equality are possible. It's simplistic, it's naive, and to my mind, it's absolutely necessary as a guiding lodestar that orients politics. Without the romantic moment here, Politics, as we'll see, is merely function. There have been, since the 60s, social movements all around the world that operate under this umbrella of the idea that another world is possible. These social movements are often horizontal, suspicious of leaders, suspicious of hierarchy, involved in the purity of the process and the means that are used. They are suspicious of representation and reform. They seek a purity of living democratic multiplicity in the moment. Civil disobedience is a romantic type of politics. To this, I would contrast politics not as romance, but as function, because politics is also the art of limited possibility, of negotiation, of compromise, of temporary agreements of limited resources. An important German sociologist, Max Weber, expressed the thought this way. Politics is a strong and slow boring of hard boards, which is funny in English because boring means two things. It means to drill and also going to your local school board meeting every Thursday can be boring. But that's where the hard work of politics takes place. Politics as function has to do with means and ends of achieving always temporary results and achievements. So not civil disobedience, but knocking on doors for your favorite candidate, whatever party you support, is hard work. The point here is that we need a little bit of utopia and idealization and love to keep us going, and it's also true Politics involves slow, hard, often frustrating work. Romance without function drifts towards what Hegel called being a beautiful soul, which can be quite dysfunctional. Function without romance declines towards bureaucracy and hierarchy. And here I just will say I'm working out for myself my own experience of in my life having been spent a night in jail for civil disobedience, a night during which I learned more about the meaning of freedom than any other night in my life, and having been tear gassed at a demonstration, and on the other hand, just having spent three years as an associate dean. <laughs> the least romantic and most functional and bureaucratic of experiences one can have. 
how to bring these together. It's not easy, as many of my students say, well, it's both. No, it's not that simple. It's hard to bring these together. It's not easy to distinguish harmful and constructive romance. Not all romance is romantic. I mean, not all romance is democratic, excuse me. Religious, fundamental, religious fundamentalists and anti-immigrant nationalists express romantic functionalism. The person who mailed those letter bombs was doing something guided by their twisted ideas, their twisted hopes. Religious fundamentalism and anti-immigrant nationalism are often hostile to democratic multiplicity. It's objectively more difficult to mediate multiplicity, to find structures that are adequate to that eventful experience of being in common. So the first point here is that not all romance is helpful or positive or humanizing. And there's a related point here, and I'll conclude what I want to say about politics with it. It is challenging, and we have been challenged for 50 years to develop philosophies of history that are adequate to our shared complex reality. Philosophies of history, narratives, stories that are simple enough to motivate people and yet complex enough to do justice to reality. And I use that phrase literally. Reality is multiple and complex. To do justice to reality is to live in and with that complexity. That's what justice can mean. We lack philosophies of history that can answer some basic questions. Who are we? Where have we been? And where are we going? To answer those questions, you have to have a philosophy of history. And what our world needs is a philosophy of history that is true to the reality of our common shared multiplicity. There are divisive philosophies of history easily on display. Terrorists are coming to kill you. Immigrants are coming to take your jobs. These are visions of who we are, where we've been, and where we're going. And they are, as I'm suggesting, inimical, hostile to democratic multiplicity. Since the 60s, we've had, we have had, greater difficulty developing philosophies of history and motivating narratives with respect to climate change and economic disparity, and racial justice, and sexual violence. There's an objective tension between our condition of complexity and multiplicity and the challenge we have articulating a vision of what are we for? Who are we and what are we for? And I think we have inherited this tension for 50 years beginning in the 1960s. Extremists only have to be against or be nostalgic for a world that's not coming back. It's a lower bar. So at that point, I want to turn now to my conclusion and say four things about our relationship to 1968 today. First, I want to draw a distinction as a thought experiment between 1968 and the 60s as an era and 1968 and the 60s as an age. The era of the 60s is over, and it's been over for a long time. It may be the case that we still live in the age of 1968 in the 60s, because it is remarkable that some of the most burning issues of our time, terrorism, human rights, neoliberalism, gender reordering, religious politics, all began in earnest in the 1970s in the wake of 1968. All these issues we grapple with have been forming a constellation for the past 50 years. The era may be over, but we find ourselves 50 years later caught between our return to normality and being involved in an ongoing process of struggle to articulate and experience democratic multiplicity simultaneously around the world. It's remarkable that 
there are no major conferences on the conclusion of World War I that I've seen this year. A hundred years ago, okay, maybe there's some. No, no, no. I didn't know. <laughs> there's been a lot of conferences in 68 that have been on my radar. We don't memorialize 1918 or 1945 or even 2001 the way we do 1968. There's an open-endedness to what was 1968 in a way that there's not necessarily, I think, about 1918, 1945, and 2001. We argue over its representations and legacies in ways that have a contemporary resonance in ways I don't think World War I is in the public sphere today. The second point, a completely unverifiable conjecture is that the experience of simultaneity and multiplicity has intensified over the past 50 years. We now live in what I call an eternal now of infinite instance. Instance. I've only checked my phone twice since I've been speaking, and it's <laughs> killing me that I can't do it more. All right. An eternal now of infinite instance. Earthrise, that image, is an empty truism. It's lost its powerful salience. What I think the generation of 1960 had as an advantage over us was confident philosophies of historical action. And we lack that in our day. Our eternal now of infinite instance is separated from our capacity to answer, which many people in 1968 could, those questions, who are we, where have we been, and where are we going? The great image of our eternal now is the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam in 2014, and poor Rembrandt is being ignored by these millennials with their phones who are in this world-class art museum, and Twitter exploded, and Facebook exploded with this. And so it turns out, though, that the students were working on a class project using the museum's website on their phone. So it wasn't the students who were symptoms of the eternal now. It was our own ganging up on them and our own reaction, which shot all around the world instantly. Third point. In spite of our eternal now, there are vital living traditions today that can trace their roots directly to 1968 movements, from gender and sexuality emancipation to peace, environmentalism, and anti-racism. That complex legacy, from the personal all the way to the environmental, in search of coherent philosophies of history. I want to say in passing, perhaps I wasn't there last night, but in reference to the discussion of Catholicism and the 60s, to point out two important books, Jared Rayner Horn, who teaches in uh, Paris, James Chappelle's new book, he teaches in history at Duke. Horn shows that for Catholics and the church around the world, the 60s were a positive and negative experience. He says that it was Catholic universities in Italy and the Netherlands and Belgium that were the first sites in Europe of student unrest before secular universities. He reminds us of the powerful worker-priest movements in the 1950s and 1960s, long before the 60s happened. And he recalls an important North-South Solidarity Conference in 1970 among liberation theologians and North American and European uh, uh, clerics. James Chappelle goes back to the 1930s and he says, the church has been in tension between two, dot, two voices for a long time that become particularly acute in the 1960s, what he calls fraternal Catholicism and paternal Catholicism. Paternal Catholicism, the structures of the church, the hierarchy, the organization of the church, and fraternal Catholicism, ecumenicalism, uh, uh, conciliar, and uh, local parish Catholicism. In other words, James Chappelle says, even before the 60s, as the church is embracing modernity, a dialogue is happening that becomes particularly acute in the 60s and continues to this day. And that dialogue and even that debate can be summed up in the following ways. Those Catholics who say Vatican II went too far, and those who say Vatican II didn't go far enough. And this also is an open-ended 
an unresolved legacy of the 60s that shapes our world today. Another relationship to eternity, which is not about smartphones. Uh, and finally, it seems to me that we're now far enough away from 1968 and the 60s to relate to that era in new ways. And we can locate that eventful era within more extensive histories. That tension between romance and function is not new. That preceded the 60s. Every 10 years, what 68 was changes, like a kaleidoscope. In 2008, there was more new interest then of the global 60s. And scholars for the past decade have invested a lot and created a lot of knowledge about the global 60s. In 2018, I'm hearing new things that I didn't hear 10 or 20 years ago. New interest in saying, what about conservatives in 1968? What about the experience of parents as well as their children? What about the experiences of police in 1968? The ability to distinguish 1968 as a project of emancipation, and on the other hand, a 360 degree understanding that there were many faces and many voices, many protagonists in 1968. New in 2018 are what people are describing as the South-South 68, the relationships between Africa and Latin America and Asia that had nothing to do with what was happening in Berkeley and Chicago and New York and London and Paris. This rich interpretive plurality, I think, will enable us to avoid two potential dead ends. It makes no sense to me to say that the movements of the 60s simply failed, because history is not a midterm or a final exam, which you can indeed fail. History continues to move and undulate and does not stop. If there was failure of these movements, it happened in the 80s and 90s, and that's a separate conference and a separate conversation. 1968 did transform the world. The second potential pitfall, and this is often the case with 68ers themselves, is to set 1968 and the 60s up as an impossibly high bar. A good old days, and compared to that time, everything else will always fall short. We will not experience again the precise confluence of events that occurred in the 1960s. History doesn't work that way. But we can be open to new events, new possibilities. Not a replay of what happened before, but the emergence of unexpected, surprising, eruptive events. And to be honest, I have great optimism and confidence in my students in ways that I haven't had in the in previous years of my teaching career. There are certain analogies between 60s and early historical moments. In 1968 itself, the famous German philosopher Hannah Arendt wrote to her friend Karl Jaspers, it seems to me that the children of the next century will someday learn about 1968 the way we learned about an older revolutionary movement and moment, 1848. She drew analogies between 1968 and 1848 while thinking of us in the future. I think there are analogies between the 60s and today. Pervasive injustice remains. Social action involves risk, fear, the possibility of failing, which terrifies everybody under the age of 26. But I don't think we're done with 68. And the fact that we continue to talk about it and interpret it and work through its legacies means that, as the Latin legare, the origin of legacy, says, the 60s have bequeathed many things to us, us, and we are bound and connected to that time in ways that remain vital. Thanks for your time tonight. We will take comments and questions and uh, maybe some pushback or clarifications, whatever you'd like. Anybody feel like uh, diving in? So um, I'm a 1968 graduate of Loyola University. 
What? And yes, and so these events were very much part of my life. I was also a Chicago resident and participated in a lot of what happened in Chicago that year. Mm. Um, I think a piece that has been missing and that helps me understand um, what's happening in my world today is that uh, 1968 was the year that uh, people like me who were born in 1946 came of age and graduated. Mm -hmm. And we were the beginning of this huge generation that had grown up in post-war, mostly okay. prosperity in the United States, okay. in different situations in Germany and in France. They were also post-war babies. That's right. Um, and um, we did see possibility, and we did see uh, the potential for change, and and, and we did try to live out some of that um, later on in our lives. And I was involved in a lot of, I mean, I was in some early feminist stuff and some early environmental stuff and some early civil rights stuff. And a lot of us tried to live that. Mm -hmm. um, also born in 1968, within a few weeks of me were Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our generation, part of the reason we're still talking about 1968 is because we've been dominating the politics. Mm -hmm. And what gives me hope now, mm -hmm. looking at the generation coming up from Parkland, looking at people with new energy to take up issues around Black Lives Matter and Me Too and that stuff, is that I see the hope that comes with another generation, a bigger generation than my generation. And I think it's time mm -hmm. for younger people now to, to, to seize the mantle uh, and, and, uh, and not to imitate what we did or to necessarily maybe learn some things from us, but to take their own momentum forward. So that's my comment. That's I wonderful. just feel like there's a generational uh, issue uh, that ha there's a generational moment of mm -hmm. 1968. You see all those movements you're talking about, all those people, they were all my age then. Mm -hmm. They were all post-war, mostly, right. not entirely. I mean, Jesse Jackson is older than I am, and he was part of it. And, mm -hmm. um, but So it's that sense, and my hope now is that it's, I feel like it's time for us mm -hmm. to yield to the hope that's in this room. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's Very well said. Done. Very well said. Thank you. Did you want to have no, the class well, of 2018? I, I, I don't know. That. That's wonderful. <laughs> Should the class of 2018 respond? You never know. I'm always pushing. Anybody? Ramblers Unite? Ramblers? <laughs> oh, I was a Rambler fan, too. Well, what's not to like about the Ramblers, huh? <laughs> what do you think, Julian? No, I, and that's hard to follow, except, I mean, just to, to, to build on one thing that I had said of, you know, there was some graffiti in France earlier this year that said, forget 68, fight now, right? So part of, uh, to move away from the trap of nostalgia, one, one of the dangers of romance is romanticism, and that is to idealize and feel nostalgia, and again, to set up that high bar, and part of what I'm, I guess I'm arguing is to say, you know, the lesson here is an example of events, not the model of events, but the experience of being open to the new. And the powerful voice of hope is it that it comes with youth and energy. And that's why I really resist this, language, this talk that's very pervasive sometimes of failure. Oh, we failed or we didn't. Well, what was your criteria of success? You know, if you think, we think in longer timelines that every generation has certain responsibilities to engage and pursue justice and solidarity within a particular generation and time frame, then the scale, the horizon changes, right? And I, I agree. I mean, I would say, and, and I think there's also, you know, time to have some critical discussions too. I think it takes great humility to say, you know, we, it's time for us to step aside. You know, historically, history worked out pretty well for the baby boom generation in terms of education and property values and employment. There was almost full employment in 1968. Part, one explanation of the 60s is that young people at that time, late 60s, early 70s, before the oil crisis, didn't have to worry about employment, and so they could generously think about what was happening to, in Vietnam 
or what was happening in Central America or Cuba or, or other places in the world. You know, my students, since 2001 and 2008 in particular, I call them, you know, they're so, people are terrified that if you get a B minus that you will be homeless and unemployed for the rest of your life. And it's hard to have that generosity of spirit to imagine commonality if we're all worried about, you know, if we're going to get jobs or not. So, so I, I really, it's, I think it's a very bold thing that you said to talk about passing the baton of generations, which I think is very powerful. And I say that as a card-carrying member of Generation X, who can talk about events, but we never experienced any. There was no event that defined my generation in the way that 9-11 and 2008 have defined this current young generation. I, too, am, am an Xer, and the only people we blame more than the boomers are the millennials, <laughs> because we don't have an event to hang, hang our hat on. Right. Anybody else want to make a point? Here we go, David. That, that was really terrific. Thanks, David. Really thought-provoking. I've heard a lot of these talks. and uh, That one really, really had me thinking, and, and you, you said things I'd never thought of. Mm -hmm. I've heard 200 1968 talks in my time, so thank you so much. One of the things that I was trying to reckon with, and again, I'm thinking out loud because of, of the provocation you gave, you talked about event. And I, I love that. That was a very, very, very incisive conceptual tool. The event is a very dangerous event politically, and I think you suggested that. The event opens up the possibility of, of the impossible. And the solidarity within that moment is something that's hard to ever Again, mm -hmm. it is as you suggested the opposite of what politics is really about, mm -hmm. which is the careful struggle to win people over to your side and solidarity toward a cause that has real implications in everyday lives. Yeah. And I was trying to think, what's different about 1968, where you have events that, as I suggested earlier today, kind of drove people crazy. Mm -hmm. That's right. Lent themselves to a politics of the impossible that did not win over. Mm -hmm others who were not already, always already of the same mind. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to compare it to what happened after the horrific events of the shootings, the school shootings, yeah. where you had kids who lived through a moment so horrific and so terrible, and they were able to translate that into structure. And I was trying to figure out what made 68 different, what made structures dissolve in 68, SDS dissolves right. in the horror of event and the wonder of event. Mm. And what makes 2018 student movements seek structure mm. and seek continuity good. after a horrible good. or tragic or moving event? Right. And there's something in that contrast between then and now that I'd like to think is actually because people have learned from 68. Yeah. But I, I, I don't know, just, I was no, just that, thinking about event and process and yeah, yeah. politics and, and I structure. think of the instrumental politics versus the romantic politics. Yeah, right, right, right. Anyway, right. No, no, just thank you so much. No, really no, but thanks. That, I mean, that, that's probably, I, now you've given me more to think about as well. I mean, you know, for these, not just these French thinkers of the event at this time, but there's philosophers of the event that continue in France today. That, it's a whole tradition. There's this guy, Alain Badiou, and it's very difficult stuff, but he has for the philosophy of the event. And it's not without problems, but he would say he wants to distinguish between true events and false events, right? So that 19 guys in airplanes and 9-11 was not an event. It was the response to 9-11 of people getting on the pile and the guy in his pickup truck driving from Texas to help out. So for him, an event as a philosopher is only that moment of freedom conjoined with solidarity, of being together. Events do not, for him, pull us apart. So to be, we were overtaken by events or events made us crazy. I and mean, when you said that, I was thinking of the Weather Underground documentary where Mark Rudd says, Vietnam made us all crazy. He said, I can't believe the things that we did. And, and that wonderful thing you said about um, um, uh, uh, the Brown moment of kind of, uh, uh, no, what was it? Brown. John Brown moment, that's right, of kind of, you know, we're going to go gun violence, right? So that, anyway, I'm not sure that this is persuasive because he, he went, he, how do you distinguish between false and, and true events, right? That's his move. A lot of times I hear people in social movements say, well, there's a struggle. Well, struggle, I mean, Jihadists struggle, you know, the Navy SEALs struggle, you know, unless there's that lodestar of a vision, an experience of commonality to orient the instrumental politics, 
then instrumentality has its own logic. So, so how, how, that's why it's a difficult dialogue for me of eventfulness. And just the last thing is that I also would complain to political theorists who say, well, if we can just get the right normative political theory, once we get the model right, then we'll all just follow it. Well, no, that's not it either. That's why this, this language of ethics and this, or politics otherwise is something I'm playing with, but I, haven't, I don't have an answer, really. So I'm thinking as well. As a millennial who also happens to be a historian, um, <laughs> I want to throw out two questions for you and it, uh, for a fabulous talk that I really enjoyed. And the first is to think about what might be the defining event for the millennials is actually the global economic crisis. It's not 2001, it's not 9-11. Sure. And I think the reason I bring up 08 and that global crisis um, is because one of the things that it has helped historians see is that actually what the supposed economic security in Western Euro in the Western world, U.S. and Western Europe, was built on really shaky financial products, which meant that the children of the baby boomers, the Gen Xers, and then the millennials would have a less, they would not have be enjo enjoy what in Europe they called the politics of productivity, or but in the U.S. the sort of post-war prosperity was actually always built on a precarity that we're seeing the longer legacy of, which, which for me, why I agree with you, there should be more about 1918 right now and the and the collapse of empire of the European empires and the rise of the very short American century because 68 to me seems the end of the American century mm. and the second part of that um, related to this is this question of that I totally think you're right that we're still living in the age of the 60s but are we now thinking about the upheavals around the world and the rise of strongman pop, pop, uh, strongman populism around the world sometimes by women uh, like Marie Le Pen are we now looking as we're finally sort of getting out of this age, and what does that, what does this new age look like to a historian, and how we sort of reconcile with those questions? Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, you no, know, powerful. Um, fair enough that 2008, not 2001. I do think that there is a culture of fear and anger and anxiety, which has to do with precarity. So precarity can be about lack of security, security in both a violent sense as well as economic sense. Um, agreed about kind of the precarity of neoliberal economics and really, you know, one part of 19, an important happening in 1968 that is not part of the traditional narratives is the sterling crisis and the move off the gold standard. So that n the financialization of capital, the turn to post-industrial economics, I mean, there's people here who know more than I, um, is also a marker of 1968. And the, the end of the boom be uh, starts to happen before unemployment goes up, starts to happen before the oil crisis and prolonged period of series of crisis of boom and bust, and we are reaping what has been sown for a very long time. So uh, I agree with you there. The events of 2016, the American election and Brexit, made my social media feeds among European historians explode because all the people who study the interwar period said, finally, we can talk about populism and racial populism and fascism. Right, So there is a way that part of our distancing from 1968 is that our own horizon of experience is also being recalibrated and shifting. Events provide horizons of historical experience until there's new events that change that horizon. We're talking more about the Depression and interwar politics in the past decade than we were the previous 40 years. Right now. Where I think that we're far enough away from 68 to revisit it is I'm interested in the question from people who lived through the 1960s that actually to create a social movement is hard work and it requires commitment and sacrifice and patience and the willingness to fail and the willingness to compromise. There's a woman, um, Bernadine Devlin, who was one, the leader of the Northern I Ireland uh, uh, civil rights movement, and so negotiation is not just, you know, official politics and liberalism, she negotiated with the police. So that protesters and the police negotiated in the 60s the whole time. Can we do this? What are the limits? What are you guys going to do? So there's a way that the dialogics of negotiation and social movements, in other words, the, the short version of what I'm rambling about is every generation has to relearn lessons that were learned the hard way by previous generations. And so that, that type of knowledge and wisdom cannot be packed up and simply handed down. And yet, I think there's important work to be done about the 60s of how are social movements that have staying power and resonance 
developed. And the last thing I'll say is, as a historian, the big question I have is, between 1848 and 1968, and I am talking about the West here, there's a narrow optic, there were generations of social movement that yielded changes in law that bettered people's lives, from women's right to vote, to labor unions, to civil rights. Popular protests and institutional change, there's a very clear history there from 1848 to 1968. What I don't know as a historian, have we been in a long period of quietness in terms of disconnection from that tradition, or is that an era that is over? Is the era of street protests and all that stuff, is that gone the way of telegra telegraphs and the Model T, you're right, and, and uh, earlier historical forms that have become antiquated? That's, that's the question that kind of eats at me, and because I'm a historian, I don't have to answer it, you know, because I just have to study the past, I don't have to solve the present. Did you want to follow up? I That's right. And that, oh, so, well, whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, that, for me, is where I think it's really inspiring to see how we carry forward these legacies of human, and we see a search for community, because part of the other thing that's going on, I would argue around the world um, in that post-68 moment, is a, what, what, what some, in, urban, uh, in, in urban policy we call more like cocooning, that sort of, that sort of stepping away from that sort of, and that's a part of the reaction against it. This is why SDS falls apart, it's because of the weatherman, the violence. But now we have a way of people are searching out community again and using these new novel forms to build those bridging networks right. around the world, which is really incredible to think about what re-globalization looks like and how that re-globalization of the world economy and politics looked like after 68 and how it keeps to evolve as they have the new technology harnesses and why it is interesting that there's tremendous profit to be made off of this new social media and the so-called sharing economy, but there's tremendous opportunities to co-opt it for what we would call progressive causes, which I think is just opens up tantalizing things to look at the past and see how others have done it around the world in previous eras. That's great. That's great. We have one more. Uh, I asked uh, Astrid Golders. I ask your indulgence. Thank you. Um, um, you know, there, we had a young person, Mark, raise his hand. But I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the young people, and I'll pray for them tonight, to come to our last panel tomorrow, which is all about students from 1968 in 2018. So I hope the students can come and um, really engage at that point. But this gentleman here is next in line. So this will be our last uh, comment and question. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you for speaking tonight. Um, you know, if there's one person that it captures um, 68 to me, it's, it's Dr. King. And not just because he was killed in, in 68. It's because that's the person from 1968 that we seem to quote um, more often than um, than any, anybody else in this day and age. And it's because but we seem to quote him very inaccurately because we, we don't even quote the I have a dream speech in its entirety. We just quote that little snapshot from it. And um, that was in 63, but uh, if we should note that later, shortly before he was killed, Martin Luther King seemed to backtrack from that message so um, quite a bit. He said that, you know, he, he had regretted that. In his mind, he had only, all he had done was serve to integrate his people into a burning building, as he mm. put it. Mm. And... You know, he also said the, uh, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice, which he also seemed to backtrack towards the end of his life. And do you think that um, pretty much people, regardless of a generation today, have been pretty naive in, in, a, in like, taking that part, of his, um, in that part of his message, like, believing that? Because things, not only do things not seem to have changed for the better all that, as much as we like to believe with the rise in, say, after Obama was elected, so many um, um, extremist groups seem to be on the rise. Um, so, and well before even well before the current administration came to power in 2016, um, 
you know, there, there seemed to be uh, obviously Dylan Roof in South Carolina, like murdering people and stuff like that. And all the, you know, the needless to say, including the city of Chicago, Oakland, California, where I'm from, I, I you know, I was on the BART platform that night when that police officer shot Oscar Rant, Oscar Rant in the back. You know, I'm from Oakland. I, I, I'm from like five minutes away from where that happened. And it seems that um, another thing, I know, the public school system, not only here in Chicago, but also in California, where I'm from, seems to be resegregating, not not desegregating, and um, not to mention the attacks uh, waged on things like the Voting right, Rights Act and Civil Rights Act. So do you think that people learned, I wouldn't say didn't learn from 1968, but maybe learned the wrong lesson? Mm. So one, that's, a powerful, that's a powerful question with, with many elements. So this is just tell you what, what came to mind. We can, we can talk more. I mean, there is a book about 1968 in America that called, the title is The Year the Dream Died. And there is a way that one of the narratives is that a certain optimism or movement, uh, forward movement visions kind of ended in 1968, which is the opposite of the beginning of a long struggle, the beginning of a process. And it is true, and others in this room know more than I about this, that the shift from fighting laws of segregation through legal changes in that process was a different moment than the turn north, in other words, towards questions of militarization and economic inequity. And the unrealized, the unknown that we have is what would have happened if King had lived and what would have happened on these questions of housing and the sanitation workers as the great symbol and also his opposition to the Vietnam War. And what, what would that story of continuity have, have looked like? Um, I will say something about this, this Obama, post-Obama moment and the, the white anger that has been raised as, and I would simply draw a contrast between what I would call easy humanism and difficult humanism. Easy humanism says Obama was elected, race is no longer an issue in this country, we're a post-racial society, right, and it did not take very much not to create new white rage, but to unearth white rage that has been there the entire time, right? Difficult humanism is not, okay, easy humanism is we're all the same. We're a colorblind society, right? Difficult humanism is to engage in dialogue with our differences and accept our differences, accept and live with our multiplicity is not an easy challenge. It's not smooth. It's a process that does not have an end because it's a process of dialogue and encounter that unfolds over time. And there's no moment when we say, well, we've got it. We've got it. And so there was a naive response to the Obama moment to say, oh, now we're, we got this. We're post-racial. That's a superb insight to end the evening on. I'm going to be using that in class for sure. That distinction is excellent. So please join me in thanking Dr. Borg for a wonderful keynote.